My name is Colin Rogerson and I am a solicitor advocate at Lewis and Cornwall, a niche family law firm based in central London. I was admitted as a solicitor in 2011 and I qualified into the firm as a specialist international children department, um, headed by Emery Hutchinson ABE. Um, since qualifying I've developed um, a significant practice in the law relating to surrogacy and assisted reproductive technologies. I'm a member of the International Surrogacy Forum and the American Bar Association's Assisted Reproductive Technologies Committee. I was recommended in the Legal 500 2013 as the go-to lawyer for surrogacy. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, the surrogacy law in England and Wales. Since the 1980s, when it was a little known curiosity, um, surrogacy has become a real alternative for parents who cannot conceive a child naturally to have a child of their own. Despite this emerging trend, there is a huge disparity of legal approaches towards surrogacy, not only on a global scale, but also across the European Union. As a consequence, we've seen growth in international surrogacy, with couples taking advantage of um, foreign laws which are more liberal and less stringent. California and certain other US states, although not all, India, Ukraine, have developed themselves as global centres for intending parents seeking surrogacy and we're seeing more and more countries pop up as um, global centres for surrogacy. Um, despite this emerging trend of international surrogacy, there's no international law relating to surrogacy. There's no recognition or conventions dealing with the regulation of surrogacy arrangements. So it's an area where conflicts of laws arise and children are born into lacunas um, where they can be born stateless, um, which is a situation that the Hague, the private international Hague conference is looking into um, whether or not to do uh, to start a, a convention, or the possibility of a convention along the lines of the Intercountry Adoption Convention in relation to surrogacy. Amongst those intended parents who are going overseas to commission their surrogacy arrangements are British based couples. And why is that? Well, surrogacy law in England and Wales has developed since 1985. The first known child born as a result of surrogacy in England and Wales um, was born in 1985. And as a result of this, Parliament passed through some knee jerk legislation called the Surrogacy Arrangements Act 1985. Now, the 1985 Act remains in force today and continues to act as the regulatory framework for our surrogacy and regulates what people can and can't do in respect of surrogacy in this jurisdiction. Now, the Surrogacy Arrangements Act um, defines a surrogate mother as a woman who carries a child in pursuance of an agreement made before she began to carry the child and made with a view to any child carried in pursuance of it being handed over to and parental responsibility being met as far as practicable by another or other persons. The Act also provides um, that no surrogate arrangement um, is enforceable by or against any of the persons making it. Thus, a surrogacy contract cannot be enforced under contract law, either by the intended parents or by the surrogate. This gives huge legal uncertainty to both parties to the agreement. It's also a criminal offence for a third party to effectively broker a surrogacy arrangement on a commercial basis. So, it's a criminal offence for agencies to operate on a profit-making basis to facilitate these arrangements or even for a lawyer to be instructed to draw up um, a surrogacy agreement. It's not, however, a criminal offence for the surrogates and the intended parents to agree between themselves a commercial surrogacy arrangement. There are further restrictions on advertising uh, or a willingness to become a surrogate, making the process of finding a surrogate much more challenging. Surrogacy agencies that operate in the UK do so on a not-for-profit basis. The unenforceability of surrogacy arrangements acts as a deterrent for surrogacy in the UK and together with the difficulty of making surrogacy arrangements has led most British intended 
parents to look overseas to commission their surrogacy. Now there are a number of issues arising from surrogacy, um, legally including and um, most importantly the attribution of legal parentage which has all sorts of implications from nationality and citizenship to wills, inheritance, intestacy, guardianship and parental rights and rights of custody. Now in surrogacy there are a number of players that could be um, recognised as legal parents of a child but surrogacy is a form of assisted reproduction and as such we look to the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Act of 2008 which replaced the 1990 Act of the same name to determine the legal parents of the child. Now section 33 of the 2008 Act defines the mother of the child as the woman who carries the child as a result of the placing in her of embryos or of sperm and eggs um, and no other woman is to be treated as the mother of the child. Subsection 3 provides that the um, section 33 um, applies regardless of where in the world the child is conceived or born. And we also operate within a two-parent model, so English law will only permit a child to have two legal parents, although of course we know that a child can have more than one parent in inverted commas with parental responsibility. Section 35 of the 2008 Act provides that where the surrogate, where the mother, as defined by Section 33, the surrogate, is married, then her husband will be treated as the legal father of the child. Um, there is a slight proviso in that if the surrogate's husband did not consent to the arrangement, then he will not be treated as such in law. Section 42 creates a mirror provision for women who are mothers under Section 33 who are in a civil partnership at the time of the treatment to, um, for their civil partner or same-sex spouse to be recognised as a second legal parent. So let's look at some examples. Anne and Barry are a married couple who cannot conceive a child themselves. Anne has suffered a number of miscarriages, but for medical reasons she cannot carry a child to term. They enter into a surrogacy arrangement with Charlotte, who is married to David. An embryo is created using IVF with the sperm of Barry and Anne's own egg. The child who is born, um, consequently, is the full genetic child of Anne and Barry. Is genetic and intended parent. Under the HFEA 2008, Charlotte, the surrogate, is the child's legal mother, and her husband, David, is the child's legal father. The application of the HFEA 2008 in attributing parentage doesn't just create a rebuttable presumption, it's a statutory imposition, and DNA evidence um, confirming to the contrary does not rebut this presumption. Using another example, Alex and Jack are a gay couple. They enter into a surrogate arrangement in California with Karen, who is unmarried. They create embryos using sperm from Alex and an egg donor donated from an egg donor. Karen is the legal mother under Section 33. Alex, as the biological father, and because Karen is unmarried, is capable of being recognised as the legal father. And although the surrogate arrangement took place in America, so the child would have an American birth certificate. And Section 4 of the Children Act, which allows for unmarried fathers to obtain parental responsibility by virtue of being registered as the father, only applies to births registered under the Births, Deaths and Registration Act. So that does not apply to children born in America who are named on a foreign birth certificate. So in that circumstance, although Alex would be a legal parent, he would not necessarily have parental responsibility and steps would be needed to be taken to obtain that parental responsibility. Now most people who have a child through surrogacy want to be recognised in law as the legal parents of their child and they do not want their surrogate to have any legal rights. Also, um, what you see when you practice in this area is that most surrogates 
are most concerned that they do not have any legal responsibility in respect to the children. And although there is this fear that a surrogate will change her mind, the greater fear um, and the greater risk in many cases is that the intended parent will change their mind and leave a surrogate lumbered with a baby that she doesn't want or you know, able to care for. So the 1990 Act, um, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act of 1990, introduced the concept of a parental order. A parental order is an order designed specifically for surrogacy situations, whereby the intended parents are vested full and exclusive legal um, parentage and any rights of the surrogate are excluded. So in many ways it's a fast-track adoption order because it's much easier to obtain than an, an adoption order um, and it's a less invasive and lengthy process and doesn't involve social services. Section 54 of the 2008 HFEA really widened the scope of couples who were able to apply for a parental order. And Section 54 of the HFEA sets out a full statutory list of the criteria that each applicant needs to meet before the court is able to make a parental order. Case law has um, told us that where there is an international surrogacy arrangement, the applications themselves will be heard in the English High Court. Domestic surrogacy arrangements are usually dealt with in the Magistrates or the Family Proceedings Court. Um, but all international cases should be administratively transferred on issue to be heard in the High Court by a full High Court judge. The statutory criteria is all set out in Section 54, as I've said, effectively only applies to surrogacy cases where a, a woman carries a child as a result of placing in her of embryo or of sperm and eggs, and there must be a genetic link between at least one of the applicants, one of the intended parents, and the child that is conceived. It doesn't matter for the purposes of the 2008 HFEA, or indeed the Surrogacy Arrangements Act, whether or not the surrogate has a genetic link to the child that she carries. In most professionally arranged surrogacy arrangements, there will be no genetic link between the surrogate and the child that she carries. She will be what is known in the surrogacy world as a gestational carrier. She will not be using her own eggs um, to carry the child. Oh, sorry, to conceive the child. Um, the next issue that the court has to consider is whether or not the applicants fall within the class of applicants that are able to make the application. The 1990 Act restricted the scope of applicants um, to heterosexual married couples. But in 2008, the class of applicants was widened to include couples in a civil partnership and um, couples who are unmarried or not in a civil partnership but are living together in a family type relationship, an enduring family relationship um, that's not within prohibited degrees of separation of each other. So the class of applicants was significantly widened in 2008, which came into force in 2010. But it didn't cover single commissioning parents. And there are a number of men who commissioned surrogacy arrangements um, to become single parents. But they're not eligible to apply for a parental order because a parental order can only be made as a joint application by two applicants. court has to make sure that the application for parental order has been made within the first six months of the child being born. This is a strict statutory deadline and there's no jurisdiction in the court to extend it even on a discretionary basis. This is an important fact to remember, particularly in international surrogacy arrangements and if the couple have gone to less developed countries where there are complicated legal factors um, relating to the child being brought back from the country of birth um, 
India, for example, intended parents expect to remain in India for several months post-birth until the formalities have been complied with for the Indian reg or Indian authorities to allow the child to leave the country. But in those circumstances, it can be quite easy for intended parents to simply miss the six-month deadline, possibly because they're not in this jurisdiction and they've not yet thought about formalising their rights. But it's certainly something that intended parents need to be aware about and that lawyers operate in this area need to be careful to ensure that applications are made within that six month time frame. The surrogate has to consent to the making of an order and it's, it's, the consent has to be freely given with full understanding of what is involved and unconditional. Now in practice that's done by signing um, form a101, which is a court form available on the court service website. If the surrogate is based in the UK, then her signature will be witnessed by a member of CAFCAS. If the surrogate is overseas, then her signature has to be notarised and her consent form has to be notarised. Where the surrogacy arrangement involves a country where the surrogate may not speak English or there are literacy issues, then further evidence would need to be adduced to satisfy the English court that this surrogate has, in fact, um, freely consented to the making of a parental order. The surrogate's consent is not valid if it is given in the first six weeks of the child's birth. So, in reality, an application for parental order is usually made um, after six weeks post-birth, but before the expiry of six months post-birth. Any consent that's obtained prior to the six-week window is invalid for the purpose of the 2008 Act. The, both of the applicants have to be aged over 18 at the time of making the application. They have to be living together at the time of the application and the making of the order, and the child has to be living with the applicants. Um, and at least one of the applicants has to be domiciled in the United Kingdom, um, or the Channel Islands, or the Isle of Man. Now this is important because many cases do turn on the issue of domicile, because the um, intended parents are living in the United Kingdom, they are habitually resident in England and Wales, but they are not able to satisfy the court that they have acquired a domicile of choice in this jurisdiction. Obviously in domicile we have a domicile of origin, which is the domicile where we are born, and then but we can acquire um, a domicile of choice if we have an intention to abandon our domicile of origin and to live the rest of our days in in a new jurisdiction. Um, domicile features a number of the reported cases and I don't have much time to go into any of the reported cases so I won't cover those but there are a number of cases which deal with parental orders um, on domicile including where um, there are same-sex families and same-sex applicants who have um, argued successfully that they have acquired a domicile of choice in this jurisdiction, citing that they would not return to their domicile of origin because of social attitudes um, towards homosexuality in their domicile of origin. So that's an important feature to consider if you are in that situation. The biggest issue with um, parental orders is the issue of payments that have been made. Section 54, subsection 8 um, allows reasonable expenses um, to be made by the applicant to um, for either the making of the order, the making of the arrangements, or for the surrogate's consent. Any expenses that are in excess of reasonable expenses must be authorised retrospectively by the court. 
and this is the issue that most of the um, parental order cases turn on. Um, so, in most commercial surrogacy arrangements, a fee will be paid to a surrogate, which will comprise, um, for example, maternity clothing allowance, um, travel expenses for medical appointments, um, child care arrangements, lost wages incurred as a result of um, the pregnancy, medication costs during the pregnancy, and many will involve a um, commercial fee that's paid to the surrogate as a result of the um, pain and suffering that she's experienced as a result of carrying the child. And this is unavoidably a commercial payment that engages section 54 subsection 8. And the court has to consider whether or not to authorise this these payments. Now most of the reported cases in this area look at the payments to the surrogate. In the case of REPM in 2013, the court was faced with a um, altruistic surrogacy arrangement in California, where the surrogate had waived her fee, but she was paid her expenses. Such expenses are perfectly permissible under Section 54A because they related directly to the surrogacy arrangement and the pregnancy. However, the applicants in the case paid a commercial agency in California where it's perfectly lawful for commercial agencies to operate. And the court dealt with the issue as to whether or not payments to third party agencies um, came within the ambit of section 54 subsection 8. And the court concluded, and it was Mrs Justice Tice, that payments to agencies um, did fall within the scope of section 54. Eight, because section 54.8 did not specifically state that payments were made to the surrogate. However, in the later case of Re-C, Mrs Justice Tice, and this was only a matter of weeks after the Re-PM judgment, went on to say that payments to an egg donor were payments usually in the region of $7,000 um, paid to an egg donor did not fall within section 54 because the egg donor had nothing to do with the surrogacy arrangement per se. So whilst payments to agencies, surrogacy agencies, do fall within section 54 and fall to be considered, um, payments to egg donors do not. And the courts have to consider when considering whether or not to exercise its discretion to authorise these commercial payments, both public policy issues, i.e. that commercial surrogacy is contrary to public policy in the UK, but also to um, the, have regard to the um, child's best interests, lifelong best interests, which were imported by Section 1 of the Adoption of Children Act 2002, which are now a consideration for the courts and make the, court, make the child welfare of the courts paramount consideration. And in many ways, under the regime as it currently stands, with the court retrospectively authorising these payments with parental orders only being available post-birth, that the court is presented with a fait accompli. There is a child who is a real child and has real needs that are being met physically and emotionally by the intended parents. And the court has to consider whether or not to authorise any payments made, bearing in mind that any decision it makes has to be based in, in the child's best interest. Now, arguably, finding that public policy considerations outweighed the welfare of the child um, really disregards the child's best interest because a child's best interest in most cases will undoubtedly be served by the parents who provide the day-to-day -day care of the child having full legal rights and obligations and responsibilities in respect of that child. It's not in the child's best interest to have a legal parent who is not in the same jurisdiction as them 
does not have day-to-day -day care of them and does not want day-to-day -day care of them. And in many cases, because either of operation of law in the jurisdiction where their legal parent lives or because they've obtained court orders, as is often the case, which vests legal parentage in the intended parents, it, it doesn't have the effect. So it creates a difficulty for the courts and, and so to date the courts have always exercised their discretion when faced with a commercial payment. To date there's no reported case where a commercial payment has been too high um, for the court to allow. But the courts are still vigilant um, against this and the case law suggests that it's only in the clearest of case of an abuse of public policy that will the court not exercise its power to um, authorise the payments. So we have our parental order system in the UK which allows parents, intended parents, to be recognised as legal parents of their child. And it's it's quite difficult really to tell the two together in, in terms of the approach that the English court, the English legislation has taken in respect to the surrogacy arrangements by saying they're contrary to public policy. Um, we're going to make it difficult for you to enter into these arrangements in this jurisdiction. At the same time, we will facilitate you um, to obtain parental rights for your child. So whilst commercial surrogacy is unlawful in that it's not enforceable and um, several aspects of commercial surrogacy have been criminalised, the family courts are able to authorise these unlawful payments on um, a retrospective basis which seems very contradictory and creates an unhappy ground and we can look at what other jurisdictions do. In some jurisdictions in the US um, pre-birth orders are obtained so when that child is born from the moment of birth that child is a legal child of the intended parents and the surrogate has no rights to it. But at the moment what's clear is that the surrogacy law is haphazard in this jurisdiction and it's not aided by the lack of international recognition or regulation of parental rights. A parental order obtained in one jurisdiction will not be recognised in another jurisdiction. So we have difficulties and the conflicts of law that will um, that are um, happening at the moment will continue to exist until there is some um, international recognition of surrogacy rights and perhaps a relaxation of the domestic laws in this jurisdiction in relation to commercial surrogacy and there's quite a strong force to say that effectively commercial surrogacy is permitted in England and Wales let's just formalise it and let's lift this artificial ban on commercial surrogacy. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions um, by email um, if you'd like to contact me by email um, my email is cr at dawsoncornwell.com Thank you for watching.